discovered uh, in the last several years is that this, this plume of groundwater that's coming toward the lake and actually continuing on to the south, and we'll see that at the end of the trip, is discharging into what they call Fisherman's Cove right here. All right. And uh, the way we discovered that was we were drilling wells. Somebody was asking earlier, you know, how do you do this? Well, you drill wells and you sort of leapfrog your way down, and suddenly there you are at the lake shore with your drill rig, and you realize the next step is the lake. Um, so the thought was that the plume must be discharging into the lake. And uh, so what we did is we went out into the lake itself uh, a, a number of times over the last several years with a number of different devices, uh, driving devices, like this one here is a good example. A little temporary uh, uh, drive point. It's a little multi-level sampler like you saw before, except it's made out of steel instead. So you can go out in the lake, in waders or in a boat, drive it in, and then collect water samples out of the top of it. And the idea being, what's the water quality of the groundwater as it's coming into the lake, right? So we see it all the way to here. What's the water quality look like? Another device we've used uh, is something like this. It's called the Henry sampler. It's a little tiny sampler. Let me just give you a, show you how this works. It's really easy. It's kind of neat. It's got a little tiny point on the end. Oh, it's that gross. And it's got a little inner rod to give it some strength. And you can see, you see the end, see how it's slotted on the end? Can you vouch for the rest of them that it's slotted on the end? Okay. And you shove it in like this, and you pull out the little center rod like that. And then you can put the syringe on it or a pump of any kind. Then you can get your water sample. That's all there is to it. Now, it's a little crappy because it's obviously... Uh, so, so what we did is we went to, um, we went to uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of locations here in the lake, uh, in this area. And uh, you see on page uh, 15, we actually mapped out what the plume looks like coming out into the pond bottom. Right? This is specific conductance. I mentioned conductance before. It's just a general measure of the inorganics in the water. Higher conductance, more dissolved stuff in the water. Uh, this is the conductance we measured. All the little dots to show you locations where they went out here with a little well point. We actually had a, a boat and we had a barge at one point because it gets a little hard to work in water, you know, when it gets too deep. Um, and we did that in three times, 99, 2001, 2003. You'll notice there's a clear change in the nature of the map as you go with time. See how it's, it's high in 99 and then you seem to see a decrease in concentrations or, or conductance as you go later in the, in the time. What that is, is that, that trailing edge we were talking about of the plume, that natural flushing is actually in this time period began to arrive right in here. The tail end of the plume is leaving this neighborhood now. And in fact, we did some sampling in 2004 and it's even more diminished. So for many years, the plume used to discharge here, but now that they've shot off the plant, it's gradually cleaning itself out and the water coming up into the pond here is obviously of a better quality than it used to be because you see that clearly indicated here. We see that with boron, we see it with nitrate, and so forth, right? Um, but turn the next page and look at phosphorus. Same three views. This is phosphorus, all right? And you'll see that the phosphorus high zone is right where we're standing right now on this bluff. And you'll notice that it doesn't change at all to speak of with time. See how it hasn't changed? Okay, that's this whole business of phosphorus retardation. The tail end of the plume is leaving, but the phosphorus is like ink on a sponge. It just doesn't want to rinse off. So it's going to take many, many, many flushes for the phosphorus to be purged off the system. And so long after the rest of the plume has left, there'll be phosphate discharging to the lake at relatively high levels because 99% of it's on the sediment and it has to flush off. Okay, so the concern is that the phosphorus load to the lake is just going to go on for almost forever, relatively speaking. And the linologists have said that's just too high a loading rate. So the military was under the gun, so to speak, to, um, to try to, to cut down on the load of phosphate to the lake because they were responsible for like 60 or 70 percent of it. So they looked at a variety of options. One was to provide sewering for all the homes. Okay, in other words, we'll let our phosphorus go in because it's too hard to get it out, but we'll, we'll, we'll take care of any new loads. 
Well, it turns out that wasn't enough. There are very few homes on the upgrading side of the lake. It's mostly the military base. Uh, they looked at putting in pumping wells and pumping. But because phosphorus doesn't like to move, you have to pump forever. So they were looking for something that was a lot more passive. When we mapped out this footprint, they began to realize, gee, the area where most of the phosphorus is coming in, it's not like a volatile organic or cancer-causing chemical where you have to get it all. If they could knock down the load by 80%, they'd be way ahead. And they noticed that the, the, the footprint, if you want to think of it that way, the discharge area was relatively small. So if they could put something down on the pond bottom, some sort of reactive media to capture it, like a sorbent, they could capture the phosphorus right where it's coming out and, and not let it get in the lake that way. And if they could do something that was passive, they wouldn't have to do anything more than that. So the idea was to find something that they could lay out once and then walk away from, right? Um, and and it's not, there's nothing wrong, that's a great philosophy. So, um, so what they did um, in um, this August, so this just literally happened just a few weeks ago, they came out here, uh, it, it's too bad, we had a, I ran a field trip for the UMass uh, Boston students uh, in August, and it was going on, it was amazing, because they got to watch it going in. Um, in an area, you can see the little pin flags out there, in an area 40 feet wide, from about, right about here, roughly where I'm standing here, out 40 feet, and 300 feet long, they put out a coffer dam. You know what a coffer dam is, you know, for engineering? It was made out of big bladders that they inflated, so they had put out a coffer dam, and then they had two pumps, three pumps that could pump a total of 6,000 gallons a minute, and they dewatered the pond up to the coffer dams. Okay? Then they came in with excavators, and they dug down three feet, and they mixed into the natural sediments zero valent or elemental iron. Okay? The idea being that the iron would rust, turn into iron oxide, and what do we say phosphorus likes to stick to? Iron oxide. So as the groundwater passes up through this reactive blanket of iron, it would be sorbed out by all this iron they added to the aquifer and never make it into the lake. That's the idea. That's why the shore is red. It's the iron rusting. This one used to be black. So this is, this is the iron rusting um, on the pond bottom and sorbing out the phosphorus in theory. Well, we've, we have not the first post-installation monitoring is only going to take place at the end of October. Okay, now we've done some preliminary, we couldn't wait. So we've done some preliminary sampling and we don't see phosphate in the water samples above the iron. All right. Um, what we did is um, there was a concern that any kind of monitoring that we would do could potentially drag iron down to below the iron zone. So if you were to try to drive things in after they put the iron in, a little bit of iron would be down with your well point, and then it would remediate the phosphorus, and you'd never find it again. So we decided to instrument the, sit, the, the site as they did the excavations. So we put out four different kinds of instrumentation. Um, let's see if I can point. That. A lot of it you can't see. Uh, one of them is right there. See that little green cap? That's one of these guys. Uh, it's one of those, like that little dripping MLS I showed you, except it's made out of plastic. We made it out of plastic because we thought that anything steel would start to corrode like crazy. Inside here, if I open this up, is a coil of little tubes. So every one of those green guys that are along the shore are these little miniature multi-level samplers. And the iron zone will go from about the surface down to about three feet. So we always have one port below the iron. So we can see phosphate down here, and then we can see the phosphate disappear as the water comes up. But does that make sense to everybody? So we have a bunch of those out. In fact, I think you have a map, maybe page... I can't read the page numbers, but the next map actually shows you where the instruments are. That actually shows you the footprint. The second kind of device we have, I don't think any of them are visible from here. I don't see them. Um, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, well, here's one right here. You can't really see it. You know those multi-level samplers we had in the gravel pit? It occurred to us, why not put some of those horizontally? So when they excavated down three feet, we laid one of those pl white plastic multi-level samplers out 40 feet with ports, just like the vertical ones, and they all come up to a road box on the shore here. So we'll be able to pump those and get samples out underneath the iron there. Um, we also have what we call the fusion samplers out there. Um, same principle I showed you with the diffusion samplers in the gravel pit, except these are made out of little 60-milliliter uh, bottles with a little nylon fabric on the end. And we actually have chambers that these bottles sit in uh, where they're in contact with the aquifer. So what we're going to do is we have a rack of these bottles 
at every like say five or six centimeters, maybe yeah, five or six centimeters. We're gonna we lower those in. We get diffusion over very short distances, and then we can pull these bottles out and analyze them for phosphate. You know, everything is geared towards trying to prove or trying to be sure that the phosphorus that's in the groundwater below the iron, as it comes up to the iron, it goes away. Do they have a plan if their first plan doesn't work? Or is it no. just a cross it's a, your fingers it, it, and... It's cross your fingers and hope like hell it works. <laughs> the phosphorus on the iron will come off eventually, but the idea is that that'll be over a long time period. Right. The concentration will be That's right. I mean, you know, in geologic time, it'll all come off. Everything's on its way. But by that point, the cable will be gone. <laughs> you know, because it's eroding away anyways. Uh, the other thing, too, is apparently... Um, I'm not a geochemist. This is where I start to really, he, he knows more about it than I do. Uh, Pete does. Um, um, uh, apparently there's a fair amount of mineralization that can take place too. So instead of just being a, a sort of a, it's like it first sorbs on pretty loosely and then it begins to really work its way into the mineral matrix. And then eventually you can actually get mineralization where you form things like apatite. So you actually get mineralization to form iron phosphate minerals, which, is, which is, gets much more solid. So they think there's actually a fair amount of almost permanent removal for all practical purposes. But the lake can take a certain amount of phosphorus. It's just this huge load for a short period of time is what's going to kill it. And what's really important is how much energy you get every year. Right. Because that's, you know, what's going to feed the algae for that. Right. Right. The annual load is important to cut that down. Right. The other thing they did is they um, dosed the pond with alum, aluminum oxide, right. to sequester the phosphorus that's in the sediment. So that binds pretty strongly to the phosphorus. And the phosphorus no longer leaches up off of the bottom. Um, now that, that was a, a big operation. That was a big well. operation. So they're trying a number of different ways to keep the water quality of the lake. Is this like a, Excuse me. Is it dimensional? Is it? Is Yes. 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 Yeah, you get to the anaerobic hypolimnion, and then you have high iron and phosphate, and it's when you have turnover, you have these algal blooms. There's a spring bloom and a fall bloom. Yeah, 60 feet. Yeah. So, so again, the monitoring that we have going on are, are vertical sampling this way. We have a few multi-level samplers that go out under the lake at different levels this way. We have these diffusion samplers, which I don't know if I explained that very well, but they're sort of passive and you leave them there. We did this because we were concerned that Anytime you pump a water sample, you disturb the flow. And so these are set up in very close intervals. These balls are all stacked so we can see very detailed gradients. Because we're trying to figure out where does all the reaction take place. Some of the chemists say the phosphorus is going to come all the way up through the elemental iron until it gets to the rusty part at the top. And the barrier only had to be an inch thick. But the bottom three feet is worthless. Others are saying, no, it'll happen at depth, and we don't know. Um, um, so um, um, anyway, so that's, those are the, the various monitoring methods, except for one other. The other method...